Thank you for coming to Washington again uh, to visit us here at CSIS. It's a real pleasure to, to have uh, such good friends uh, from Manila here in Washington. I'm Murray Bauer. I'm the chair for Southeast Asia Studies here at CSIS. And uh, it's a real honor to work with uh, Ambassador Joey Quisha and the Philippine Embassy and the U.S. Philippine Society, uh, Ambassador John Negroponte, the chairman, uh, Hank Hendrickson, uh, and the team there uh, in organizing this event. We're going to look at today at, at the dynamic Philippine economy, growth, reform, and, and a look ahead. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the team uh, who's visiting here today includes the, uh, the secretaries in the cabinet who manage the Philippine economy. These gentlemen uh, are doing an incredible job, as you'll hear today. I won't steal the thunder from, from them, but uh, it's a, the Philippines has become a very important place uh, to do business uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, it, it always was, but it's become even better and, uh, and really leading, uh, leading the Southeast Asian countries in terms of uh, its market uh, performance, and, and that's because of the leadership of the president and the reforms that, that the people that we're going to talk to today have put into place. I'd like to quickly recognize Carla Hills. Uh, Ambassador Hills is a, a leader here on the CSIS board. Carla, thank you for joining us today. It's really good to see you in the audience. My, uh, my job is to introduce a man who's really put us uh, all together in this room, uh, a good friend, uh, a real leader of the U.S.-Philippine relationship, a uh, tireless worker, uh, whether it's in the halls of the, of the White House or Capitol Hill, um, and that is uh, Ambassador uh, Joey Quisha. Joey, please uh, join us. Excellencies, um, Secretary Greg Domingo, Secretary of Trade and Industry, Secretary Rogelio Singson, Secretary of Public Works and Highways, Ambassador John Negro Negroponte, Co-Chair of the U.S. Philippine Society, Mr. Ernie Bauer, Sumitro Chair here at CSIS, Ambassador Carla Hills, and other distinguished guests. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this conference, Dynamic Philippine Economy, Growth, Reform, and Looking Ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank Finance Secretary Cesar Purisima, who will be joining us later, as he came in quite late last night. Trade Secretary Greg Domingo and Public Works Secretary Babe Singh Son, and the rest of the public sector delegation for taking time to be with us today. I also want to express our appreciation to the private sector delegation led by Mr. Bill Luce of the National Co-Chair of the National Competitiveness Council. And of course, I'd like to thank CSIS, particularly Ernie Bauer and his team for organizing this very important conference together with the U.S. Philippine Society, who I also wish to express their gratitude to for their uh, support for this uh, conference. And on behalf of my government and the secretaries, I want to express our appreciation to Commerce Undersecretary Stefan Selig for joining us today and we look forward to hearing his remarks in a few minutes. Your participation, Mr. Undersecretary, and I understand Commerce Deputy Secretary Bruce Andrews will join us at lunch, clearly reaffirm the vitality of the Philippine-American economic relationship, which we hope can only deepen and strengthen as the United States pursues its pivot to Asia. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, in a li little over a year, the Philippine electorate will return to the polls to choose their next president. Many of you are perhaps 
wondering on what to expect in a post-Aquino administration. This conference is a great opportunity for us to look back at the incredible performance of the Philippine economy that was made possible by our exciting reform story, as well as to look towards the future. Strong macroeconomic fundamentals, prudent public finance management, and good governance have led to the improvements in the Philippines' business environment and competitiveness, as well as greater overall investor confidence. In fact, the International Monetary Fund has upgraded the Philippines in its most updated forecast and stated that the country will lead the Southeast Asian region with its robust GDP growth of 6.7%, upgraded from 6.6% in 2015, and 6.3% for 2016. Concurrent with these economic developments, the Philippine Stock Exchange Composite Index has um, risen from record high to record high. These strategic gains in economic competitiveness and transparency have been validated by our positive and improved ratings under a number of institutional indices. The bottom line, therefore, is this. We are reaping what we now call the good governance dividends, thanks to the leadership of the President and to the steady and prudent economic management of Secretary Purisima and Secretary Domingo, and the hard work and leadership of the likes of Secretary Singson. In order to ensure the sustainability of our good governance dividends, the Philippine government is now focusing on a menu of crucial policy areas in the remaining months and days of the Aquino administration. This, the importance of preserving the gains of the good governance reforms that have been put in place cannot be overemphasized. The administration is firmly determined to achieve the completion of priority programs in all five pillars of the Philippine Development Plan to ensure that reforms will be sustained by strengthened public institutions, that the righteous path will be followed, that good governance becomes the norm at all levels of government, and that the gains from the transformation of mindsets and institutions will be sustained and permanent. There's also deep consciousness about the impending realization of the ASEAN Economic Community, which is expected to strength deepen further this year. ASEAN is a formidable economic force. This is precisely why, as ASEAN integration takes full effect, the Philippines is taking every possible measure to enhance its competitiveness and take on a more dynamic economic role in the region. ASEAN economic integration and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership could certainly unleash a massive amount of economic potential, which the Philippines should be well poised to take opportunity of. We're also seriously considering joining the negotiations or acceding to the Trans-Pacific Partnership soon after it is concluded. The Philippines appreciates the strategic importance of potentially being a participant in what would be significantly an important regional free trade arrangement. Infrastructure invest investments will also be vital. We aim to attain a level of infrastructure spending of 5% of GDP by 2016. We're also pursuing infrastructure development in the Philippines to public-private partnership programs. And in line with this, the Philippines and the U.S. recently signed a memorandum of cooperation on infrastructure collaboration, which we signed in New York last February together with Under Secretary Stefan Selig. We're also working hard for the passage of the Bank Zamora Basic Law, now pending in Congress, which will hope will create a regime of economic opportunity, genuine development, and inclusive growth. The economic impact of the Mindanao peace process is undeniable. Peace is the missing link to harness the full potential of Mindanao and achieve full economic development and inclusive growth. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, as you ponder the investment opportunities in the Philippines today and post-2016, I only wish to emphasize that the Filipino people have always been the greatest resource of my country, whether in the Philippines or overseas, whether in the boardrooms of top corporations 
or in the rural hinterlands of the provinces. This is why we continue to make critical investments in healthcare, social services, and education in order to empower our people to become greater participants and stakeholders in growing the Philippine economy. Before I conclude, let me return to the theme with which I began these brief remarks. What is the likely post-2016 scenario? Let me assure you today that the Filipinos will choose wisely. They will choose someone who will continue walking the straight path, or the daang matuid, as we call it, and I'm confident that no matter who succeeds President Aquino in June of 2016, the pace and the substance of reforms of good governance can no longer be reversed. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, a, a very talented uh, executive who was recruited by President Obama and Secretary Pritzker uh, to be a leader in the Commerce Department. We're lucky to have him. He's a, um, a, a very experienced uh, banker, uh, investment banker. Uh, he knows the world's markets very well. If you haven't met uh, Stefan Selig, he, he joined as undersecretary of uh, international trade at the Commerce Department about a year ago. And as uh, Ambassador Quisha had mentioned, um, he uh, has already been involved in pushing the U.S.-Philippine uh, economic relationship forward. I, it's been a pleasure to uh, get to know him a little bit. I th think you uh, will enjoy his remarks. Please join me in welcoming uh, Under Secretary Stefan Selig. Good morning, uh, Madang Omagapo. How did I do? That, that, is, that was the hardest part of the remarks. Uh, I've been in this job for one year, and I'm still uh, learning the languages of these 17 countries I've already visited, so uh, I'm trying. So first off, let me thank uh, my new friend Ernie and CSIS for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with all of you this morning. Uh, and I would also like to congratulate CSIS on its uh, recent launch of the U.S.-Philippine Strategic Initiative. Uh, I think this initiative is a perfect example of how important the bilateral relationship between our two countries has become. Uh, as head of the International Trade Administration, an agency whose mandate it is to create opportunities for U.S. businesses by promoting international trade, attracting foreign direct investment, and fostering a level playing field for U.S. businesses, we are looking forward to working with CSIS uh, through the initiative to optimize the commercial relationship between our two countries. Um, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the Philippine uh, Embassy and the U.S. Philippine Society for hosting this great event, and to thank you as well for the invitation to join you this morning. Uh, Ambassador Quisha, Secretaries Domingo and Singson, um, welcome to uh, our nation's capital. Uh, the last time I saw both of you was at the signing of the Infrastructure Memorandum of Collaboration this past February in my hometown in New York. And as I said then, the MOC goes beyond infrastructure and economic growth. It reflects the deepening of a relationship that is more than 70 years young. Finally, I want to extend a warm welcome to the members of the high-level Philippine Trade and Investment Mission who are joining us uh, here today. Uh, your participation in this trade and investment mission demonstrates that our bilateral commercial relationship has produced and will continue to produce uh, two-way benefits for our nations. So welcome, uh, Mabuhay. Um, I would like to begin my remarks today by reflecting on a panel I participated in uh, back in April uh, on the West Coast. The panel was part of the Milken Global Conference, and the title was, Is the Pacific Future Happening Now? Uh, obviously, a major reason for the increased attention on this part of the world is the President's rebalance to Asia. And the reason I chose to start my remarks today here is because the U.S.-Philippines commercial relationship reflects precisely why the U.S. Pacific, by the Pacific future is indeed happening, and why this administration is so invested in the rebalance. I think this becomes clear when we take a look at the ties between our markets, our public sectors, and our populations. 
So first, our market to market ties. Over the fast, past 15 years or so, we have collectively faced some tough challenges. A profoundly more competitive global economy, a series of natural disasters suffered by your country, and of course, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But over time, our market ties have emerged bearing real strength. This is evidenced by GDP growth in the Philippines estimated to exceed 6% in 2015, far ahead of the global growth rate. We also see this strength in the fact that the two-way trade in goods last year was at its highest peak since 2001 at $18.5 billion. That U.S. goods exports reached their highest level since the year 2000 and that our current FDI position in the Philippines is just under four and a half billion dollars. The importance of strengthening these ties is precisely why Secretary Pritzker led a delegation of American business leaders to Manila around this time last year and why we organized a health care and medical trade mission this past February and why we are going to increase the size of our commercial service presence in Manila. Finally, as we work to reach a conclusion to the negotiations of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I should emphasize that this is an open agreement. There will be opportunities for interested countries that are committed to meeting the high standards of TPP to join in the future. And that, of course, includes the Philippines. Second, our government-to-government -government ties. That includes the MOC I mentioned earlier, which will make it easier than it has ever been before for U.S. firms to be made aware of infrastructure project tenders, particularly SMEs. Our G to G ties also include the Partnership for Growth, or PFG. Under PFG, our governments are working together to help the Philippines achieve sustained, inclusive economic growth and to place the country where it deserves to be, amongst the highest performing emerging markets in the world. And the gains we have made under PFG have been remarkable and real. They include considerable progress on workers' rights, as well as actions to strengthen and expand bilateral agricultural trade, notably for our meat and vegetable exports and your fruit exports. But maybe the best example is in our collective work under the banner of APEC. We, of course, look forward to what will be an important and fruitful CEO forum in Manila this November. And it is clear that the Philippines has utilized their host country status to fully embrace a leadership role under the APEC banner. Perhaps the clearest example of that leadership is the Philippines' efforts to integrate SMEs into the regional and global economy. And a strong example of that leadership was the Barakai Action Agenda that emerged just last month. This action plan is not a list of lofty principles. It is a roadmap comprising clear priorities, policies, and specific deliverables whether it is advocating for streamlined customs and, customs and rules or automated solutions to increased efficiencies, promoting finance mechanisms and increased institutional support for SMEs, or exploring concrete ways to increase the number of female-led SMEs. This is precisely the type of action plan or roadmap that leads to an environment for growth and prosperity. And it is a roadmap that is guiding our g to g collaboration currently. That includes the APEC global supply chain that we recently held in Atlanta, with participants representing all 21 APEC countries, economies and panels addressing supply chain management, cold chain storage, and related technical regulations. This was both a successful convening and an achieved deliverable under the Barakai Action Agenda. Within the, SM, within the APEC SME Working Group, our two economies have also worked on advancing business ethics among SMEs. That work led to 19 new industry ethical codes across nine separate economies. And we have also worked together to reduce barriers to digital trade. At our working group meeting in Atlanta this month, the Commerce Department proposed the development of a digital economy action agenda. We believe this framework will help SMEs utilize e-commerce platforms, internet-based systems, and other aspects of the digital economy to globalize their businesses. The comments period, in fact, closes tomorrow, so we are all looking forward to working with the Philippines on our next steps together. Finally, our G2G work 
was also seen in the effort to bring about a successful conclusion of the trade facilitation agreement negotiations. This was an essential goal since the OECD estimates that for every 1% reduction in global trade costs, global incomes increase by $40 billion. Of course, the Philippines is currently chairing the WTO Preparatory Committee on Trade Facilitation, so this is just another example of our two countries working together with the Philippines taking on an essential leadership role. But leadership requires more than being a change agent for the region your nation is part of. Leadership also requires being a change agent for constructive progress within your own country as well. That is why we applaud the Philippines in making the important advances in IPR protection and enforcement which led to removal from the special 301 watch list. But there are still opportunities for the Philippines to show this kind of leadership. Prior to coming to Congress, as was mentioned, uh, to lead the ITA, I spent almost 30 years in the private sector building and guiding a successful investment bank in New York. At the core of my work was identifying attractive market opportunities for my clients. And having worked with a large and diverse set of clients in my career, I can tell you that all investors look for the very same things. Ease in doing business, a clear commitment to rule of law, sound IPR protection that secures and incentivizes innovation, transparent and predictable markets, and public sectors that act as engines for growth and prosperity. That is why we are ready to work with you on the progress you have already made. That includes helping establish a regulatory framework that encourages and incentivizes foreign private sector participation, and working to establish value-based procurement practices that utilize life cycle cost analysis and best value determinations. Finally, there are the people-to-people -people ties. Just yesterday, I attended a meeting of the U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, where our Vice President delivered remarks. And I think his words say it best. 7,632 miles of our shoreline breaks on the Pacific Ocean. We are a Pacific nation. Last year, President Obama extended that sentiment with regard to the Philippines. He said that between our peoples, we feel a spirit of Kalaoban that expresses itself in so many ways. That spirit makes sense given the way our people mutually enrich each, other, each other's lives every day. 350,000 Americans reside in the Philippines today, while roughly 600,000 U.S. citizens visit the country each year. On the U.S. side, approximately 4 million people of Philippine descent reside here, and more than 160,000 Filipino-owned businesses produce growth and prosperity in our economy every day. The depth of those ties is also reflected in how we have lifted each other during the worst of times. In the beginning of my remarks, I stated that the relationship between the U.S. and Philippines is now 70 years young. And as the delegations here today know, that number was not chosen randomly. As Presidents Obama and Aquino acknowledged, last year marked the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Leyte, which signaled our collective fighting in World War II. Americans and Filipinos fought side by side to stave off the scourge of global fascism and to liberate the Philippines. And today, American and Filipino World War II soldiers share the same burial ground on the same island nation. And so you can draw a clear, bright line between the Battle of Leyte 70 years ago and our work to help the Philippines recover from Typhoon Yolanda. The $90 million in humanitarian aid, the 55 metric tons of food assistance, the emergency shelter materials for 560,000 families, or the restored functionality of the Tacloban municipal water system that brought clean water to 200,000 people. All of this is to say that our commercial partnership reflects more than the convergence of our markets and our public sectors. It represents the culmination of a, and continuation of a deep and profound people-to-people -people relationship. Given all this, it makes sense that discussing the U.S.-Philippines commercial relationship invites a larger discussion on the rebalance. Our commercial relationship has meant more than the exchange of goods, services, and financing between our two countries. It has been an engine for and a product of a partnership that has resulted in mutual prosperity, increased security, and diplomatic strength. 
So in fact, the U.S.-Philippine relationship is more than a building block for the rebalance. It can be seen as the predecessor for this very rebalance. Our commercial relationship proves that the U.S. engagement with our Pacific partners can help Pacific nations secure our mutual interests, our commercial, diplomatic, and strategic interests. I look forward personally to continuing this in this tradition, and I look forward in working with all of you to do just that. Thank you for having me, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Undersecretary. Uh, it was a great opening to our, our conference. I'd now like to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, the Honorable Greg Domingo, uh, the Secretary of Trade and Industry of the Philippines. Now, just to date myself a little bit, uh, I think I first visited the Philippines in 1986. There was a lot going on that year. Um, even then, uh, I knew about a young uh, uh, leader, uh, Wharton trained. I think you're an Ateneo. Uh, I better get that right, because if, if I'm wrong about the Ateneo, Ateneo um, graduate who uh, was a leader in, then in, uh, in many Philippine companies. Uh, he worked also in the United States, uh, in our financial sector, uh, everywhere from Philadelphia, Pittsburgh to New York uh, in, in leading investment, uh, investment companies and in banks. And then he went back to his country um, and started to take a, an active leadership role in economic management of the Philippines, much like Ambassador Felicia did when he led the country's central bank. But Greg Domingo has, is a real patriot. Uh, if, if you think about leadership in the Philippines, he led the Board of Investments. Uh, he served as DTI, or Department of Trade and Industry, undersecretary uh, for uh, the Industry and Investments Group. Um, and anyone who's had anything to do with uh, understanding where the Philippines' journey has, has been and come uh, on the economic side uh, knows that this man uh, was exactly the right choice uh, to lead the Department of Trade and Industry. I would say the results that we've heard about already show that. Uh, it's my true honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Greg Domingo. Mr. Secretary. This is a tall mic for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Ernie, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I just greet my ambassador, Ambassador Quisha. Uh, of course, Ernie Bauer uh, from CSIS. Uh, we have um, Secretary Singson of the Department of Public Works and Highways, uh, Ms. Carla Hills, uh, ex-USDR. Um, uh, a good friend, uh, Matt Bond of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and uh, other members of the Philippine delegation, uh, the executive director of the PPP Center, Cosette. Where are you, Cosette? Okay. And, uh, and uh, Under Secretary T. Milim Gauco, the Department of Transportation and Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I arrived here yesterday afternoon. I was met with a hot blast of air as I got out of the train station. And then afterward, thunderstorms, and I said, that feels like home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here today, really, to, uh, to present to you this morning some of the wonderful things that are happening about, uh, in the Philippines, in particular, our growth story. But uh, since Undersecretary uh, Selig, uh, who had to leave already, uh, mentioned a little bit about APEC, I wasn't planning to discuss APEC. I just want to start it off by saying a few words about our uh, efforts on uh, SMEs in APEC, because uh, this is one of the core uh, issues and topics that Philippines, as chairman of APEC this year, is uh, pushing for. And uh, Under Secretary Selig uh, mentioned uh, the Barakai Action Agenda for SMEs. Uh, actually, it's MSMEs because we inserted the word micro. So it's micro, small, medium enterprises, which we call for short MISMEs. 
we coined that term <laughs> at Boracay, uh, which uh, was held in uh, the ministers responsible for trade was concluded last, last May. And the Philippines presented an action plan for MISMIS. Uh, it's not uh, a dream, it's a very specific things, action steps that we wanna, we wanna push through. And we, Philippines presented this as a skeleton to the body, and there was broad and deep support for it. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the Department of Commerce fully supports uh, this initiative. Uh, the, the logic behind this is that for the longest time, for decades really, that we have progressed on the global trade agenda. But a lot of the policies, the rules and regulations that govern global trade today, whether it's WTO, ASEAN, or the other uh, regional trade agreements, uh, the benefit has mostly been directly uh, been addressed to the large companies. And that's not by design, it's by default. Just because in the discussions that have ensued in the global trade fora, uh, a lot of these small guys were not represented, the, in particular the micro and small. So what has happened is that uh, global trade in terms of uh, pushing forward the liberalization agenda has been basically stopped because there's significant opposition now to furtherance of liberalization, trade liberalization. And because aside from the traditional op opposition for global trade, which are which coming from the farmers first, then of course you have the domestic vested interest that's always there. But now adding to this is a growing voice from the micro and small enterprises. And you cannot blame them. Because the micro and small basically say they see the entry of products from other countries, but they themselves cannot avail of the FTAs because of the very cumbersome rules and regulations that make it difficult for micro and small enterprises to participate. Talk about rules of origin and, and customs uh, regulations, etc. So the Boracay Ag Action Agenda is an attempt to make the benefits of free trade felt by the micro and small enterprises. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there because I can go on for another <laughs> hour discussing this topic. Let me go on now. Uh, from the time President uh, Aquino took over the reins of government five years ago, our country has experienced remarkable growth. We have averaged over the last five years, 6.3% uh, GDP growth. And uh, this performance assumes added significance when viewed against the backdrop, the global economic slowdown that has been seen during this uh, same period. And this accomplishment was not due to chance, but really uh, as a result of hard work and unity of purpose. Hedging the call, heeding the call of President Aquino for transparency and good governance, the government and the private sector work jointly together to create an enabling business environment and to make the country more competitive. These efforts, together with other reforms, did not go unrecognized. So, during this period, the Philippines improved its rankings on many fronts, and I will just mention a few. Uh, we improved 53 places in the World Bank ease of doing business rankings during this period. We improved 33 notches in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. We improved 49 uh, levels in the Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. We improved 39 steps in the Heritage Foundation's Economic Freedom Index. And during this period as well, all three major credit rating agencies, Fitch, Moody's, and s and have elevated the Philippines to investment grade status. The strong economic performance and improving competitiveness have been supported by many factors. One, tax reform. Uh, we've had tremendous tax reform in the Philippines, which has resulted really in uh, 
the growth of our tax revenues, double-digit growth of our tax revenues since the Aquino administration started. This growth is every year, okay, double-digit growth, We're resulting in a deficit to GDP of less than 2%. Our target is actually 2%, but we're having a difficult time spending all those additional tax revenues that are being generated uh, every year. And uh, then we had uh, tremendous reforms in the government procurement, especially in the area of Secretary Singson, who does all the roads and bridges in the Philippines. And tremendous savings have been uh, realized because we have shifted basically to public bidding for all of the projects of government. And this has resulted in tremendous savings. We've continued to liberalize in a very big way. And uh, just last year, as, as, as uh, may have been mentioned, is that we, or you may already know, is we liberalized banking again, so opening it up to foreign banks to enter the Philippines. Uh, we are in the process now, final stages, of allowing foreign contractors to be 100% owned, I mean, to have 100% owned operations in the Philippines. We have just released the foreign investment negative list, and we've reduced the list uh, drastically, particularly in the practice of professions. We are about to pass a revised cabotage law that will allow our foreign ships to call on multiple ports in the Philippines to, so that we can lower our logistics cost. Uh, Philippines no longer really has a state-owned enterprise problem because we've lib sold off, privatized most, most of that uh, starting in the mid-90s. And, uh, and uh, then we continue to push for our economic zones. Uh, in particular, the economic zones in the Philippines are very business friendly. So 80% of our manufactured exports actually come from the economic zones because it is very easy to do business in our economic zones. It's first world uh, type of uh, uh, schemes and uh, practices there. The, the economic zones, uh, you do not even have to deal with the local government. Uh, if you operate in economic zones, you just deal with the administrator. But really our greatest asset is our human resources. We have a population of about 100 million with a median age of 23 years. So half of our population is 23 years old and below. And based on the list that I've seen, uh, somebody has to check it because there might be a really small country with the lower, but uh, based on a very comprehensive list I've seen, Philippines is the youngest in Asia. And uh, these, hundred, these young people are well-educated, highly trainable, hardworking, loyal, and English proficient. They, this has made possible the phenomenal, phenomenal growth of our outsourcing, business process outsourcing industry, which uh, the, we started about 5,000 workers in 2000, about 15 years ago. Last year, we surpassed a million direct jobs in this industry, and it's still growing at 15 to 20% per year. And this industry has provided the construction boom in the Philippines. It's one of the main reasons because each body that is hired by this industry, just imagine one million bodies over the last, uh, workers over the last uh, 15 years, that's five million square meters of office space, plus all these new residential units that they have to purchase, where, because these people are paid way above uh, minimum wage, they're able to afford cars and, uh, and houses and appliances. So car sales are up 20 percent, 27 percent in 2014. Uh, this industry accounted for 18 billion dollars of revenues last year. Of course, uh, we have a fair amount of Filipinos as well working abroad, uh, about 10 million of them. So about one fourth of our workforce works overseas, and uh, they work as uh, doctors, nurses, architects, engineers, accountants, teachers, mechanics, seafarers, and all sorts of service staff, staff uh, providing cash remittances in excess of $25 billion in 2014. Now, these young people we have, right, to realize the demographic dividend from our young population, 
over the next few decades. The Aquino administration is heavily investing on education and infrastructure. So it's one of the ingredients to make sure that you have strong economic growth for decades to come, uh, the young population, but that's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Those who are in mathematics can understand that. Uh, to make it sufficient, you need to educate them so that when they get to the working age, they can find good and steady jobs. And so the government has invested heavily in education. We have doubled the education budget from 2010 to 2015. So that classroom textbook and teacher shortages have been addressed. We have also restructured our primary and secondary education by passing a law that makes it from 10 to 12 years to align it to the international, general international practice. And we have aligned course offerings in higher education to industry needs. This trust has been complemented by a significant increase in the budget for tech vo technical vocational training, which is uh, up over 80% over the last five years. The second component of ensuring long-term economic growth is investment in infrastructure. And the Aquino administration has also done this. We have, from 2010 to 2015, the Aquino administration has more than tripled the infrastructure budget. This is just the on-budget items. This does not include the PPP projects, which are above or beyond the budget, because they are privately funded. So it was mentioned already by Ambassador Quisha that we target from 2.5% of uh, GDP, infra infrastructure spending as a percentage of GDP, 2.5% in 2010. We're going to target 5% by next year. We're already at 4% this year. And more to come on this infrastructure. We're really spending, uh, trying to devote a lot more spending on infrastructure. These are uh, some of the primary factors contributing to the Philippines' success, but that is not all. I will add some more. We have a uh, diversifying manufacturing base. Uh, in fact, we used to be dominated by electronics products, uh, up to about 70% of our Total exports were in electronics products before. Now it's down to 50% because we have increased the product range that uh, we have been off we have offered. This would include, uh, for example, our exposure now to the aerospace industry. I think very few people know this that the Philippines actually is part of the aerospace supply chain. We. We have a firm there that supplies flight control systems to the biggest manufacturers, the Airbus and the Boeings. We, we produce galleys in a very big way. One of the biggest suppliers in the world is uh, based in the Philippines uh, to supply the galleys and then the toilets. And now we're starting to supply the flooring. Uh, and uh, then we now manufacture a lot of medical devices. We do a lar uh, lot of projects now on large-scale uh, steel infrastructure. These are oil and gas platforms. This would be parts of petrochemical plants that are modularized, built in the Philippines, then shipped out and assembled to the final destination. We do bike parts, carburetors, uh, anti-lock brakes for the world's biggest car companies. And then we also have a diversifying services base. Again, I think very few people know, Philippines is becoming an MRO hub, maintenance repair operation for aircraft. We service up to the biggest aircraft, like the A380s. And uh, we have two big ones in the Philippines that are doing it. One is Lufthansa Technique, the other one is Singapore Airlines. But Airbus Helicopters has recently put up a servicing also for, their air, for Airbus Helicopters in the Philippines, and some more putting up as we speak. The... We are, in our back office processing, we do service a lot of the global hedge funds in terms of their back office requirements. Uh, we do a lot of SAP programming. We're talking about tens of thousands of SAP programmers in the Philippines doing for the international market. 
We, we do global consolida consolidation of financial statements for some of the world's biggest financial institutions. And we manage the logistics of uh, a very big uh, European oil company, a global oil company, but the, their logistics operations in Europe are done out of the Philippines uh, and, and more. The, the other development recent that I would I'd like to just do a few more points and then I will conclude is Philippines was granted by the EU, by the European Union, uh, GSP plus status last uh, December 25. So it was a Christmas gift to the Philippines. Just like the GSP here in the US, which I hope will pass soon, uh, uh, Europe has a GSP and a GSP plus. Uh, the GSP status in Europe, in EU, gives you about 2,000 plus product lines of duty-free access to the EU. The GSP plus status give you, gives you 6,000 plus product lines of duty-free status, about two-thirds of all their product lines. And they don't ask anything in return for that. And in East Asia, Philippines is the only country that has that st GSP plus status. So what does this mean? So for US-based, uh, uh, US firms wanting to set up a manufacturing base in Asia that will service the ASEAN and the EU market, Philippines would be an ideal, ideal location to put it in place because we have duty-free access to ASEAN and the EU. So that's very unique to the Philippines. Uh, and then my second to the last point, there, there is a, a study by HSBC that was released uh, two or three years ago, that where they, they project the top economies of the world by 2050. And in that study, they showed the Philippines basically improving from 38th place, in, at that time they did that study, to 16th place, one sixth. One six. Uh, so we will. They project that the Philippines will be the 16th largest economy by 2050. And if you look at the top 15, there is no other ASEAN country there. So they're saying that the Philippines will be the largest ASEAN country by 2050, bigger than Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam. So. So I think that says a lot about the future of the Philippines. And then finally, I just want to state that yes, we are very much interested in joining the TPP because <laughs> there, it seems like uh, there's some confusion on where the Philippines stands on this issue. As early as 2011, I already uh, issued a statement to the media that Philippines would like to join TPP and since then, the president himself has issued several statements in the media saying we would like to join TPP. But for some reason, it's being filtered. So when it reaches here, it's not clear that we want to join TPP. So I want to state it clearly and equivocally that we want to join TPP. So I thank you for that and have a good morning. I hope whoever's live tweeting this has uh, got that one because that's, uh, that's important and, and the context is just right. We're, uh, as you know, uh, I think we'll have TPA uh, passing in the Senate here today and uh, that will be very good news, uh, I think, for the United States and, and certainly for the Philippines and, and, and our TPP partners. Um, I'd like to open in, uh, up the floor to a couple questions. Uh, in just a minute, my uh, colleague Matt Goodman uh, who's our uh, Simon Chair for Political Economy uh, at CSIS and, had, and came to us from the White House where he was the uh, Sherpa for APEC and, uh, and EAS uh, issues. So Matt, Matt knows these issues very well. 
Matt will bring a, a panel out, um, and, and Secretary, I think you're, you're on that panel too, so people have another chance to ask questions, but I can take a couple questions before we start, and um, if, you, if you're on this side of the room, raise your hand high so I can see you <laughs> over the side. Uh, right back here, I think that's my friend Butch, but I'm not sure. Uh, here's a question for Secretary Domingo. Could you just identify yourself? Uh, yes, um, my name is Patrick Ferraren. Oh, Patrick. Okay. Yes, I'm actually with the Bohol Restoration Group. My question is, uh, while it is very uh, ambitious to also be part of the TPP, the Philippine Constitution uh, seems like it's an impediment to, to that uh, directive. So um, how are you going to make that happen, and how soon do you think the Philippines could join the TPP? Thank you. Well, when it comes to constitutional amendments, very difficult to make a prediction. Uh, I think uh, nobody really knows if and when that will happen. There was a, an attempt in Congress, actually, to uh, modify it, uh, and, but as of uh, last week, uh, the House Speaker uh, said that they don't have enough votes right now to, to make it happen, but there will probably, probably be another attempt later this year. But having said that, I, I think that the, the Philippines, if you look closely, at the restrictions uh, in the Philippines, it's actually uh, how would I, how would I say it? Relative to the SOE issue, state-owned enterprise issue, which uh, some members actually of TPP already have that problem. Mm -hmm. I think our problem in the Constitution is much less severe than the SOE issue. So. I'm just saying that if SOE is acceptable uh, and there's, they're given a time frame to solve it, then I think the Philippines should be also given that leeway to have time to try to remedy that situation, whether legally or, uh, I mean, through law or through the constitutional change. Yeah. Good question. Uh, uh, this gentleman here in the green shirt. The microphone's coming to you, sir. Uh, microphone there for you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Domingo, Secretary Domingo. Uh, thank you for give, giving us the wonderful news about the Philippines economy. However, uh, in all the reports I've been reading about the economic growth and how to sustain it, nothing has been mentioned about this, the growth of the maritime industry in the Philippines. During uh, in, in in mind that because of its economic, because of its geographical location, sustaining economic growth will go on and on. Also with the growth of the maritime industry, mm -hmm. uh, it has there been a long-term strategic and plan for modernizing and creating more port facilities in all over the islands. Yes, uh, actually, uh, later in the, in the session, uh, the head of the PPP Center is here, as well as Secretary Singson mm -hmm. of DPWH. I think they can provide you with the list of projects, in particular on the port side. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, yeah, also, uh, Timi, sorry, Yusek uh, Lemkauka is also here of the OTC. So they have a complete list of the airports and the port projects that are right now being considered or about to be bidded out. The, but we are, we are addressing this issue. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that also the cabotage law actually uh, is, our bill is about to become law, I think, because it, if I'm not mistaken, it already probably passed the BICAM. Mm -hmm. So it will be soon submitted to the president for his uh, Signature. I have to check whether it passed the BICAM, but it, uh, the last, when I left the Philippines, it was uh, being, it was in BICAM already. Uh, so that will allow foreign vessels to call on multiple ports. So that will drastically improve the efficiency of logistics in the inter-island shipping. So. 
Other questions for Secretary Domingo? I, I just wanted to ask one more before we uh, switch to the panel, and that it's sort of the link between economics and security. And I wondered if um, you mentioned the TPP uh, very clearly, uh, uh, without uh, no no doubt about that. But there's another agreement that the U.S. and the Philippines have uh, that's sort of in the Supreme Court now called the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, or yes. EDCA. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I know you're the Trade uh, and Industry Secretary, but I wondered if, if you um, could tell us where you think the EDCA stands and, <laughs> and how do you think about it from, a, from an economic uh, manager's perspective? I was asked a similar question in the South China Sea uh, two years ago at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And my response was, uh, uh, you're asking a trade minister to talk about foreign policy. So I hope my foreign minister doesn't talk about trade policy. <laughs> no, but uh, actually, I, it's very hard for me to comment. Maybe we can ask Ambassador Quisha to provide us uh, <laughs> Uh, as an, an update uh, on, on Fair where that I'll stands. Ask him yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, so, Ben, I think we'll, uh, we'll take a, a short break here and we'll, we'll ask our panel to, uh, to come up. So please join me in thanking Secretary Domingo for his remarks. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSAS, uh, work on um, international economic policy, particularly in Asia. So uh, this is a, um, a conference that is I'm not in charge of, but I'm uh, very interested in. Philippines is obviously an, a very important economy in the Asia Pacific and one that I'm uh, looking forward to learning uh, even more about today. We have a terrific panel this morning to uh, deepen the discussion that you've already heard about the Philippines economy uh, and investment opportunities in the Philippines. Uh, we're later going to have another panel uh, diving more into the infrastructure questions, but no doubt we're going to touch on those here as well. Um, I uh, am not going to introduce our panelists in depth because I think you're more interested in hearing from them than from me. You have biographical packages so you can uh, study their backgrounds in more detail. You've already met Secretary Domingo, and um, I'm going to give him the floor uh, after the other panelists have talked to see if he wants to add anything to elaborate on things that have been said by other panelists. Uh, but I'm going to move through the other panelists. Uh, on your uh, right of me, uh, my left, uh, is Bill Luce. Guillermo Luce, it's listed here, but he prefers to be called Bill. And um, he is the uh, co-chairman of the Philippines National Competitiveness Council. And you're going to hear more about uh, what that is and what it does. Uh, and its mission um, in a minute. Uh, so Bill will go next. And then, um, and then Andres Glusky, who is the chair, uh, president and CEO of AES Corporation, which is, uh, as everybody knows, a, a leading IPP, an independent power producer, which has a, a big investment in the Philippines. And so we're going to hear about AES's uh, experience uh, on the ground in the Philippines. Uh, and then Matt Bond, who is a vice president uh, at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, he is the just returned or recently returned uh, Philippines uh, country director for the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation. <laughs> compact uh, that MCC did in the Philippines, which uh, is still underway. And so we'll hear more about that. And uh, so with that, I will uh, let the panelists speak. I'll, I may ask a question or two, and then I want to open up the floor to discussion. So uh, with that, Bill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bill Luz. I'm the uh, private sector co-chairman for the National Competitiveness Council. And just to, to give you a brief introduction of the council, it's a uh, government-created uh, council, but half of whose members come from the government and the other half from the, from the private sector. Secretary Domingo is the chairman of the council, and I serve as the uh, private sector co-chairman uh, for the council. And as the secretary already mentioned, uh, well, our job is to build up the global competitiveness ranking and position of the Philippines uh, across global tables, which measure anywhere from 145 to 190 uh, economies around the world. So that's pretty well 99.9% .9 of global GDP uh, measured in these reports. And uh, we track uh, 12 uh, different competitiveness indices uh, all of them global, and uh, we use that to benchmark the country, 
to use it as our diagnostic tool for figuring out what to fix uh, within the, uh, the country and to improve uh, the country's overall competitiveness and its environment for, for doing business. So as the Secretary mentioned, uh, we've already moved up uh, in a big way through many of these global rankings. In the IFC Ease of Doing Business report, we're, we have, we're up 53 positions in the last four years. In the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index, we're up 33. For the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, we're up 49. For the Economic Freedom Index of Heritage Foundation, we're up 39. For the Global IT Report under World Economic Forum, we're up 10. For the Travel and Tourism Report, also under World Economic Forum, we're up 20. And for the Global Enabling Trade Index, we are up uh, 28. In at least four of these global rankings, the Philippines is the most improved country over the last four years, showing the biggest jump among all economies. So my main message is really, how, how did this happen and why do I think it's going to continue to happen uh, beyond this administration? The first is that uh, there's been a great deal of public-private collaboration as far as the Council is concerned. Uh, we work closely, uh, public and private sector, uh, with, through all our working groups and all our regional competitiveness uh, committees, which are the subnational uh, level committees, and through all our task forces. Uh, each of our groups are chaired by public and private sector uh, representatives, and the membership is roughly 50% public and 50% private. So there's a great deal of interaction and collaboration that happens uh, all of the time. So I think that's, that's the first characteristic that has brought us uh, some success. The second is that uh, we work uh, across the national agencies, a wide range of them. So uh, as an interagency body, we work across uh, all agencies of government, including the uh, Office of the Ombudsman and the uh, Supreme Court for issues that concern uh, judiciary and uh, governance, for instance. And governance is a big part of, of what we do. Um, we also happen to work uh, through local government units because we view local government units, the cities and municipalities, as the building blocks of national competitiveness. So we work across uh, many local uh, government units. And finally, we focus a lot on, uh, on governance and performance metrics and, and, and benchmarking uh, across uh, all the indicators and comparing against uh, groups of countries, but mainly against ASEAN, which is the arena we work in and which happens to be one of the most competitive regions uh, in the world. So it is a particularly tough region for us to, to operate in, and we had a lot of catching up to do. Uh, when we started work together uh, in 2011, uh, when the current uh, council was reorganized, we were in the bottom third of the world across most of these rankings, and we were dropping. Uh, we've moved up into the just above the median, and our goal is to move to the top third by uh, 2016, by the end of this administration. So we are in the in the right trajectory, and and uh, we should be in the top third by by next year. Uh, some of the uh, Projects uh, uh, have are, are focused on things like the ease of doing business. So this is important if you want to attract investments and to build up small and medium scale enterprises and micro enterprises and startups. We needed to smoothen out and streamline uh, ease of doing business. So that we have done. On the governance front, we've worked with uh, national and local agencies to put them on balanced scorecards. So management tools that make them uh, more effective agencies uh, delivering their uh, uh, strategic plans and operating plans and making them a, a reality. This year, about 15 of these agencies, including the Department of Public Works, will be externally audited by uh, audit firms that uh, NCC will be uh, engaging for this purpose. So no, it's no longer self-disclosure, but they will be, they will be audited. Uh, Department of Trade, Department of Public Works, Department of Health, Department of Education are just among the agencies that will undergo some of these, um, some of these audits. And finally, I want to stress that uh, those of you who know the Philippines might think normally of just Metro Manila or maybe Cebu, but uh, we felt that we needed to have a lot of uh, local government engines working here. So we've created a ranking system for city and municipality index. Uh, two, three years ago, we ranked 285 cities and municipalities. Last year, we ranked 535 cities and municipalities. 
this year in July, we're going to announce our ranking for 1,098 cities and municipalities. So now businesses will have a better basis for determining where they want to locate their businesses because we're, we're not judging them based on perception or survey, but we've collected a massive amount of data on each of these places. So we have the metrics on each of these uh, cities and municipalities, and now we'll be able to rank cities, municipalities, and provinces. So le let me stop there and answer a few questions later on. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so, thanks so much, Bill. Uh, really uh, very clear, very concise, very um, <coughs> concrete and, and, and helpful to those of us who, who aren't following those, uh, those issues as closely and I think really uh, an impressive um, um, a series of uh, data to, to work with. So really appreciate that. We'll come back to that. Uh, Andres. Sure. Well, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here today and be able to share AES's successful experience in the Philippines. To give you a little background, AES is a Fortune 200 company. We have about $17 billion in revenues a year. And when I came in as a CEO, we were in 30 countries. And one of the things I decided was that we really had to focus on those markets which were really most attractive for us. So today we're in 18 markets. And those markets where we're in today, we want to grow and, and deepen this relationship. So one of those countries we decided we chose to stay in and to grow was the Philippines because we think it had a very uh, attractive set of circumstances. The first, as a U.S. company, I don't think there's a more welcoming country for U.S. investment than the Philippines. And there's a lot of shared cultural norms and perceptions, so it's an easy place for us to do business. So our first uh, big investment in the Philippines uh, was a thermal plant in Luzon, and we invested about a billion dollars uh, in this plant. And it was a privatization, and it needed a lot of fixing up. And it took us about a year to really get this plant uh, fixed up. But what it tells you about the quality of the Philippine labor force, because we did this mostly with Philippine uh, labor, it won a number of awards. It won the, in the US we have one award we give a, a year from the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, a, from all international companies which had the sort of most improvement and best performance. And our Philippine operation won this in 2011. And it went on to win three or four more awards uh, in Asia, as well, for, for excellence of operations. Then furthermore, uh, quite, we were happy with the experience. We moved our headquarters, our Asian headquarters, from Singapore to Manila. And we were able to find the uh, very skilled people that we needed. I mean, you know, US GAAP and uh, all, local GAAP and all the translations, sophisticated financings. And, and we're very happy with that, with our having moved our headquarters uh, to the Philippines. Uh, and it's interesting, when we first went into the Philippines, and it was privatizations, and this was uh, back in uh, 2008, and they were liberalizing the electric <coughs> sector, um, not all the reforms had happened. So part of this was betting on that the reforms would happen to liberalize the sector. Uh, and I'm happy to say that most of the reforms took place, and that's very uh, important for us. Now this, I think, is a, the energy is a very important component of the economy, it's, 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 a, it's a leading indicator. Uh, the Philippines really needs probably a, a, to grow about five to, to could be higher, eight to 10% of energy uh, per year. Uh, one of the things that, um, so this is, is an excellent market for us. So we're thinking of actually of doubling uh, our investment in the Philippines in the thermal side uh, to be able to meet this demand. Um, and in, there have been some comments about the banking sector. We were, we've been able to find ample financing in the, in the local uh, banking sector. You know, we also get multilateral loans from people like the Asian Development Bank and, and the IFC. Uh, but you do have a healthy and, and vibrant uh, banking sector uh, in the Philippines. Now, we're also looking at doing um, more renewables into the Philippines in line with the government's policy. Uh, and we have a, we're the, the world leader in the use of lithium ion batteries. You may have seen the announcement by Tesla in, in the last couple of months. Uh, but we've actually been doing this for eight years uh, successfully. We've been doing it in the U.S., we've been doing it in Chile. And using these lithium-ion batteries, what it permits you to do is put more renewables on the grid. And this works particularly well in islands, and, or let's say isolated grids. So this would be perfect for the Philippines. And that's one of the things that we'd very much like to do it, because given just natural geography, the uh, Philippines could be one of the world leader in this. And it could have more renewables and more stable grids on the separate islands and more resilient to storms uh, and, and the like. So I think that, uh, again, this has been a very happy uh, relationship with the Philippines. Like all relationships, nothing, it's always 100% perfect. There, there are issues to overcome. But 
certainly the movement's in the right place. Uh, Philippines has been a very welcoming place. Uh, the government and the embassy here has been extremely uh, helpful whenever we've encountered problems. And, and again, coming from a company which is, you know, worked probably in 50 countries, I can think of very few examples where it's been more welcoming. And also I think the, what the um, country needs fits us very well, but also we found it very receptive to sort of corporate social re responsibility programs. We have <coughs> uh, programs that go from uh, potable water to rescuing reefs, et cetera, and we found very good organizations in the country from which to work. So that's really where I'd like to sort of uh, leave the, the remarks that we're very happy uh, that we went to the Philippines in 2008. We're very interested in investing more in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, continue to contribute to its uh, development and progress. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Andres. And I'm really uh, pleased our panelists are uh, following the instructions of keeping brief because it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's actually um, uh, important for all of you to, to join in this conversation. And I, I um, appreciate the, the brevity, but also the clarity of all these uh, comments because you're getting a very rich sense of of what, uh, what it's like on the ground, particularly for a company like um, uh, AES. So appreciate that. Um, Matt. Good morning. Very, uh, very nice to be here this morning. Good to see Ambassador Huizia. I had the privilege of being in the Philippines uh, for about four years, returning last year. And I was reflecting a little bit on uh, bridging some of the public and private sector comments here. So Millennium Challenge Corporation is a US government foreign aid agency. But we have a very laser focus, and that's on reducing poverty through economic growth. And you're going to hear me talk a little bit about what we're doing in the Philippines. And instead of using the term aid, I'm going to talk about it as an investment, an investment in, in the future of the Philippines. Uh, it is grant assistance. Uh, it does come from the American taxpayer. But as a, as a government, we very much uh, cherish and view this relationship and partnership with the Philippines as a key part of accelerating growth, reducing poverty. I wanted to focus on three things. So in 2010, we had uh, signed a compact. A compact is a five-year partnership that outlines a series of interventions or investments in areas to unlock growth and to reduce poverty and to achieve hopefully inclusive growth. So our model is very unique in that, number one, we only work with countries that are committed and dedicated to good policies and to developing an enabling environment for the private sector. So just to underscore, you've heard all of this fabulous movement on the data. For MCC, we have a scorecard that we release uh, every year. And just to give you a sense, the Philippines in fiscal year 2012 moved from being a lower income country in our uh, in our pool of measurement to a lower middle income country. So think about it moving up uh, boxing weight classes. So it gets a little bit harder, the punches are a little bit tougher. But what's interesting is, is despite this movement into a tougher group, peer group, the Philippines has showed uh, dramatic improvement. And I want to highlight one particular area, and that is control of corruption. And I really want to applaud um, our colleagues here and the leaders here, Bill, Secretary Sing Song, Secretary Domingo, Ambassador Quisia, and uh, Leah over here, because it's remarkable to see that since 2012, they were ranked as uh, in the 24th percentile on control of corruption. And over the last three years, they have moved to 61 percentile. So it's one of the most dramatic improvements that we've seen in our portfolio of a country committed to control of corruption. And we all know that without a transparent, open uh, market, it's very difficult to achieve the kind of growth, uh, sustained growth. So I congratulate the Philippines and the leadership for that. To me, that is an uh, important area. We, we signed a compact. It was, it was $434 million over five years. And it had three interventions. And back to this first comment about the enabling environment, the first one was about reforming, doing tax administration reform. So expanding fiscal space. And I was glad to hear Secretary Domingo's comments about the additional revenue collection that's happening. And so we've been very pleased over the last five years to see uh, tax administration be more effective, more efficient, and uh, at the end of the day, generating more fiscal space to make investments in infrastructure and social services. The second area is infrastructure quality. I had the uh, very humbling experience to fly into Taklovan 
uh, two days after uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, struck. And to witness the devastation, half of our $434 million are focused on that region. But what was most striking to me were the months that followed to see the resilience of the local governments, of the local economies, of the micro and SME, and the big partners and investors to rally around and rebuild. We are constructing 222 kilometers of road uh, in that area. And just to give you a sense, partnering with Secretary Singh Son and his group, we uh, put a real focus in climate resilient design. And so the, it's not that more infrastructure, not only is more infrastructure being built, but the quality of infrastructure is going up. In a country that has 30 typhoons a year, this is critical. So we were pleased to see that um, because of the great partnership with uh, Secretary Singh Song and his team, very little of our road was actually damaged, uh, some of which was under 10 feet of water, if you can imagine. And so that's a, a, a great highlight and an area of focus. The last area, while Philippines continues to grow, uh, which is remarkable, and the private sector grows, I know that uh, the government and both the Philippine government and the U.S. government is focused on making sure the growth is uh, inclusive. And so we undertook a project with the Department of Social Welfare and Development uh, funding, which was also something that the World Bank was working on called Kalahi SIDS, which is basically going out to local communities and working with them to teach them how to identify, design, and impl implement small-scale infrastructure projects on their own. So not only are uh, we working with the Philippine government and will actually leave behind approximately 3,000 small-scale infrastructure <coughs> projects, but to me that's the gravy. The real power is leaving behind local communities and local governments who understand how to transparently and efficiently manage public resources so that we can, at the end of the day, work ourselves out of a job, which is MCC's focus. We hope to be a spark for the country and then eventually go away and reduce the need for foreign aid and let the private sector take its role. So I think it's a great story on the policy reform, enabling environment, on improving infrastructure quality, and then hopefully decentralizing some of the capture of the private sector and uh, government resources so that growth can be inclusive and uh, sustainable over the long term. And just thrilled to see uh, Philippines has been one of our best partners, I'm glad to say. And we are actually currently working on a subsequent partnership that uh, will look at some other areas where there are constraints to growth and poverty reduction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, again, for a, a, a very clear and concise uh, presentation and, again, lots of food for thought. So, um, Secretary Domingo, would you like to say anything to supplement or um, comment on anything anyone else has said here? No, I'm okay. You're okay, so you'll be willing to take that in question. Well, let me ask you a question then uh, to get started. I said I want to bring the audience in, but I can't resist asking a couple of questions. I mean, again, I have worked on the Philippines on and off in my career at the U.S. Treasury and the White House, and, and uh, coming back to it and sort of preparing for this conference and realizing how, one, how incredibly, uh, how much progress has been made. Um, I, I ask myself sort of what do you think is the key, key factor, if, if you could point to one thing that is responsible for the, the improvements across the board in the Philippines economy and your growth rate and your investment climate and any of the, the things that we've been talking about, what do you think is the key so that other people interested in development, interested in other parts of Asia that are struggling with some of the same issues, what do you think is the key to success? Well, it was started by good governance. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Yeah. There we go. yeah, it was started by good governance, but really the key is our human resources. It's, uh, it's all these uh, young people who speak English are quite well educated and very loyal. That's why uh, it's no accident that a big part of our uh, workforce, about one fourth, uh, they work overseas because the Filipinos uh, can communicate and adapt very well, and they integrate into the societies where they, they are hosted. Uh, so th that really is the key to, to the growth that we've s seen. Okay, um, excellent. I'm gonna uh, l let you think about a question about TPP, but I'm gonna come back to that in a second. But let me ask Andres, um, you mentioned uh, in passing uh, that, that you know it's not a perfect relationship sure. and, and there are issues, if put it in a positive mm -hmm. way, what, what would, 
what would, in your view, make the Philippines an even more attractive um, investment destination sure. for you or other companies? Yeah, I think some of the things that have been mentioned, I think what uh, Bill is working on in terms of streamlining procedures and, and what Secretary Domingo mentioned as well, um, there's, there's room for improvement there. I mean, for example, to build a new power plant, you need 110 permits. Yeah. So that takes time. And, uh, you know, by world standards, that's world class too. I mean, most places, it's more like in the range of 50. So, you know, there's the, some streamlining of the, uh, um, to, to, for example, finalize liberalizing the uh, energy markets. Uh, but some of the very positive things, for example, have been the anti-monopoly law. You know, you have a more level playing field, so you have more competitors. That's very good. Um, so I think that the key is to have that, um, to continue to streamline it, because it's, it's um, you know, you get there, uh, but it, it could be faster. And in today's market, you have to move uh, very quickly. I, I would like to add just about the sort of resilience that's been mentioned. One of the things that very pleasantly surprised us about the Philippines was post-2008, when you had the global crisis, the fact that the remittances remained so strong and the currency remained strong, and that helped the economy remain strong, which was not what we saw in a lot of other economies. So it was, it was very interesting how resilient the Philippine economy uh, showed itself. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, Matt, let me ask you, because you mentioned those rather startling figures about corruption, and, and that has been an endemic problem in the Philippines and in other countries in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia in particular. And, I mean, what accounts for how, how do you move from 24th <coughs> percentile to, was it 61st, um, in three years. Um, what's, the, what's the key there? I mean, I think the, the obvious is uh, leadership, um, which is something that I think we all in 2009, 2010 were focusing on. So having a president committed to it, not just in word, but in action, and then having a cabinet that uh, was fiercely focused on it, um, I think that's one. Two is, is I, I think that it's getting beyond the um, higher level of commitment and pushing down into the bureaucracies themselves is, is the real challenge. Um, you know, it starts, for example, we were working in the Bureau of Internal Revenue, and the Philippines has a fantastic uh, tax commissioner, Kim Hinares, who is, uh, is great, but preceding her, um, the average tenure of the tax commissioner was something like 18 months. She's going on, I think, four years now, roughly. And so finding a way to get the right leadership and then have enough sustainability pushed down in the organizations and, and bureaucracies, both in the processes and procedures and really in the culture, right? I think changing the incentive structure uh, looking at uh, pay in the in civil service, I think, is is a challenge in in all governments, and certainly in the Philippines, something that needs to be looked at. Um, and and I also know there are several things underway. A great anecdote with Secretary Singson is, uh, you know, when he set out in his leadership, it was to look at the bidding processes, which is where a lot of obviously corruption happens. Uh, in most cases, is in procurement, and really focusing on. Um, those panels, the technical evaluation panels, making sure that they're independent, making sure that the individuals sitting on them are not in positions of de decision so that there's conflict of interest. And what's interesting is when you do that, you drive out this layer of uh, fat in the bids um, and you start to see cost savings. And I can't remember, Secretary Sing Song, how many billions of pesos you, you accomplished. Uh, what was the number? 40. 40. 40. 48. 48. So 48 billion pesos in savings. Now, the bigger challenge is now mobilizing and executing those resources. So obviously his challenge was, you know, he solved one problem and then created a new challenge of having to spend it out. But I think those are some ways, again, leadership, pushing it down in the bureaucracies and the practical day-to-day, -day, changing the incentive structures, and then focusing on uh, open and transparent and public procurements. I think Bill has done a great job in uh, developing a balanced scorecard where they have people stand up every six months and report out on the quality of this, uh, which was a little bit related to the MCC scorecard effort. I, I was going to ask Bill about that. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Because how, how does that work? Um, yeah, one of the um, uh, problems, of course, for, for the Philippines was uh, 
governance and could you trust uh, agencies? So one of the working groups we had uh, within the NCC set up this performance governance system and uh, deployed the scorecard, the balance scorecard system on, on agencies. And uh, they came in on a voluntary basis, starting with national government agencies. Now it includes government-owned corporations and government financial institutions. Uh, includes also the, the armed forces, so uh, Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, and, and uh, has moved into the Philippine National Police and, and into the local governments. And it's a four-stage process uh, by which uh, they have to really sort of spell out not only the strategic plan but the operating plan, uh, make it public. And as they move up to four stages, eventually they had to uh, also organize a, um, a governance, uh, uh, multi-sectoral governance uh, board, an advisory board. So uh, think of it as a, a board of independent directors uh, working directly with the, um, with the head of the agency. And uh, twice a year, we organize a forum where both Matt and I have sat on panels where we recruit a lot of CEOs to question uh, the, the plans and the programs. And uh, once you hit the third and fourth stage, the, the end of the stage, now we get the, begin to get the external auditors uh, on it. So it's not just the regular panels. And I must say there's a, there's a direct correlation in my mind between the star performers in the um, in the balance scorecard system and the way they deliver projects and register savings. And I think uh, Secretary Singson, uh, DPWH, uh, is a regular, uh, uh, his agency is a regular uh, uh, top performer among the many agencies that, that have come to us. So I, I think it's an effective system. And, and this year, as I said, by the time we get the external auditors, this is a very new, uh, uh, practice, I think, in the government, and something that we'd like to see see continue. Now, uh, you know, going back to what Matt said, it's, it, leadership does does matter. This government uh, ran on a platform of, of good governance, and on good governance leads to good economics. And and so, a lot of the effort was really focused on on cleaning up these processes, procurement, budget reform, uh, lots of transparency. Um, so. You, you see it, the results, and I think that that's why the numbers have moved up uh, across a, a broad set of indicators, um, and, and the biggest move has actually been in the uh, governance and, and counter-corruption um, efforts, and I think Millennium Challenge captures it, but so do many others. Okay, um, very helpful. Let me just ask you one more question, then I'm mm -hmm. gonna ask Secretary Domingo, then I'm gonna open it up. Um, of the indicators that you're tracking, which one sort of worries you the most? I mean, wh where do you think there is the biggest challenge for improving competitiveness, and what what needs to be done to address that? I, I, I would say right now it would be on uh, science, technology, and innovation. It's the, I believe, the underinvested area uh, for the country, uh, only because we had to focus early on on education and improving our educational system. Uh, basic, secondary, and, and all the way to tertiary. And uh, I think those basic fixes have been put in place. Uh, we've added two years of schooling, uh, which takes effect this year and, and, and next year. Uh, so we have a full uh, K to 12 program. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there's now a greater focus as well on, on vocational uh, education for those who opt to get into the vocational track. So I think the, the next step really is going to be uh, how to focus on science, technology, and, and innovation. And I think the way to do that is to not only focus on the educational system, but uh, to focus on the, on the business sector to encourage more businesses to, to, to uh, enter that, that sphere and stay in that sphere in the Philippines. Otherwise, we will train people who will just end up leaving the country. We have to provide them the career opportunity to uh, pursue that career in innovation and technology within the Philippines. The minute we do that, then we will enter that virtuous cycle. I think that is the next great challenge for us. Okay, um, Secretary Domingo, one uh, sort of different shifting gears a little bit and asking about your uh, trade policy and your integration with other markets. So you're involved, the Philippines is involved in a number of different 
regional economic integration efforts, APEC, which I, I, I know you addressed. And by the way, you may have addressed some of this in your remarks. I'm afraid I missed the second half because I was greeting our other panelists. But so I apologize if I'm asking a question you've already addressed. But um, APEC, the Trans-Pacific Partnership you're interested in, you're in the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, and, um, and of course, within ASEAN, you're uh, working towards an, an ASEAN economic community. How do you um, prioritize these things? I mean, they're not uh, zero sum. They're, they can all, uh, I think, exist together. But w which ones do you think are most important for Philippines' continued economic progress? And in particular, obviously, I think we're interested this year in APEC. Um, I'm a fan of APEC. There are not too many people in Washington who pay a lot of attention to APEC, but I think it's a very important forum and, and delighted to see the Philippines' leadership. Um, uh, but you know, then moving into TPP, how do you see uh, that is a priority for the Philippines. Okay, I think I, you missed the last part of my speech uh, I where I'm I sorry. declared <laughs> that uh, we definitely would like, like to join, join TPP. Okay. okay, but right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me. <laughs> okay, let let me just uh, describe the Philippines uh, trade agreements. We are members of obviously the WTO. We are members of APEC, although APEC is a non-binding uh, trade forum. Uh, basically, it's a lobby group. We decide on particular issues that we'd like to have a common position, and then we lobby it in the WTO or in other trade forum. We are members of ASEAN, and we only have one bilateral agreement. We've been very thrifty with bilateral agreements, uh, and that is with Japan. Obviously, U.S. is a very important uh, trade partner for the Philippines. Uh, U.S. consistently ranks either first, second, or third in both uh, as our export market and as our import source. So it, it behooves for, for the Philippines to really have a trade agreement with the U.S. in one way or another. And right now, based on U.S. policy, the only way to do that is to really join TPP. And uh, that's really uh, where our strong interest in TPP lies, is uh, aside from the smaller countries, the, the big one there is really the United States. So uh, now, having said that, we, Philippines actually is engaging now in uh, uh, various uh, trade agreements we have an ongoing negotiation with EFTA. EFTA is the European agreement uh, that is composed of the four small countries. Uh, well, not so small. In some cases, it's Switzerland, uh, Iceland, Norway, and uh, the, uh, wait, who's the fourth? Uh, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Liechtenstein. And then uh, we uh, have been approached already by at least six other countries that want to do bilateral agreements with the Philippines. So we are considering that. Uh, but our primary limitation is the number of uh, trade negotiators we have. Because between ASEAN and, uh, well, just in ASEAN alone and APEC, that kind of occupies a lot of our resources already, so we're actually recruiting people now to be able to engage in more FTAs. But it's, Philippines actually is, I would say, one of the most uh, uh, liberalized countries in, the, in Asia. If, if you look, we have probably the fewest uh, non-tariff barriers. We, we also are, you know, have been very liberal in both trade, uh, especially in trade in goods. Uh, we're trying to liberalize trade in services as well in, in, in a big way. So we'd like really to engage more. Yeah, Philippines is a very big provider of services to the global community. So we are uh, pushing very hard on liberalizing services in all the fora that we participate in. Good, okay, excellent. Um, all right, I will, um, 
invite uh, questions and comments from the floor. Uh, please wait for the microphone, which I think we have a couple of uh, circulating. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and, and do either make a short comment or question. Uh, yes, sir, right there. Thanks. Hi. Um, Prashant Parmaswaran from The Diplomat magazine. Um, thanks a lot for, for all your insights and really great diversity of perspectives. Um, I wanted to ask how we might think about the sustainability question that Ambassador Quisha and a few others touched on a little earlier. So despite the advances that we've seen given the elections and what that might look like, I realize there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen, who's going to win the election, but how might we think about what we're hearing from the various candidates or what might we expect or not expect? Thanks. It might be difficult. <laughs> you might, that may be difficult for you, but you want to try. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> uh, obviously, leadership matters, uh, and uh, and so uh, any nation will be susceptible to leadership changes. But uh, I'll share with you a tongue-in-cheek uh, type of comment. If we have a good leader, Philippines will grow at seven percent. If we have a bad leader, we'll grow at five percent. But uh, I don't know how true that is. <laughs> but that seems to be general sentiment. No, but uh, I think if you look at the Philippines, even compared to 10 years ago and today, there's really uh, a big change in many ways. One is, of course, uh, people are better educated today. Uh, people are more politically mature. Uh, they have higher income levels. And so all of those factors create a more vigilant type of uh, citizenry that watch political uh, actions very closely. <coughs> and then you couple that with the introduction of technology in particular, access to the web, where you have all these blog sites and instant uh, feedback on certain actions that uh, uh, politicians make. And it kind of has changed permanently the behavior of politicians for the better. And I've seen that firsthand over the last three years, wherein, wherein uh, actions by certain political personalities have changed overnight uh, once these uh, actions that they have taken are put in the web, and then they get inundated with all these negative uh, criticisms. And so that's not gonna change, that's there. Uh, and that is all well and good. Second, a lot of the reforms that have been put in place have been instituted already in terms of changes in law and regulations. So, even if somebody wanted to turn them around, let's say a really bad leader gets elected, it will take time for them to do that. But I think that's not so easy to reverse for the reasons I previously mentioned. Uh, third, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, there will, uh, that the choices for next year will be quite good. Uh, we still have to see, I think we'll know in about three months time who these candidates are gonna be, but uh, I think you're seeing now a new, a new generation of leadership uh, emerging, and I, I think we'll get some quite good choices. Good. Okay, Bill, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, sure. Um, I, 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 I would just like to add to what Secretary Domingo said. First, is we've been asked a lot. You know, with with the run-up to elections, will things uh, slow down or speed up? Um, my feeling is they will. First of all, they will speed up. Uh, the reason is that uh, under Philippine law, we have certain uh, prohibitions from from entering into new contracts and, and procurement within a certain uh, number of days before the election. So that means everything will need to be prepared and bid out. Uh, those that are ready for bidding out would would happen. Uh, so expect, I think, a, a speed up for some of these projects. Um, second, there's been a, a concerted effort for uh, creating conditions for what we call irreversibility of of reforms. Uh, that has to do with institutionalization, uh, uh, setting up of rules and regulations, laws, uh, executive orders, which put things in place, which make it difficult to, to reverse. But part of that is also creating a constituency for change. 
many people who want to keep that change uh, in place. So if I take a look at uh, people today, I think there, there are higher aspirations, greater expectations, and uh, social media does make, you know, enable people to, to react more quickly, positively or negatively, uh, to, to, to situations. So I think those conditions will, will have a great uh, deal, a uh, great impact on, on, on how, um, how leadership will, will surface and evolve. And if I take a look at the surveys that have come up, uh, there's been a big change. If you take a look at the surveys over the last 12 months, uh, just how public opinion has begun to shift um, uh, in, their, in their preferences. It's nothing final, but there's, there's definitely a, a change uh, is in the air. Okay, thanks. And Andres, you wanted to add something? <laughs> yes, I think, I think that's a great question. Uh, if you're investing in the infrastructure space, you don't invest for an electoral cycle. You know, if you build a hydro plant, it lasts 100 years, thermal plant 40 years, a wind farm 30. So you're, you have to think a little bit, what's the trajectory that you see in the country? So certainly in our case, we, we like what we see, and we think that a lot of the reforms will be sustainable, and quite frankly, that the changes will continue and maybe even accelerate in the future. So you know, we're putting a sort of our, our making a bet on the Philippines, and quite frankly, when we don't feel that way, we get out. And I think we have a very good record over the last couple of years of getting out of places ahead of turmoil, whether it be a Venezuela or Ukraine, et cetera. So I, we, we feel very good about the Philippines. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, back there. Hello, I'm Dane Hansen with the IATMO Group. We're an international trade association that does uh, and, and crafts construction and building codes internationally. We've done a lot of work in Southeast Asia <laughs> in particular. As a member of APEC and ASEAN, um, we uh, have done a lot of work in Philippines, Indonesia, and others. And what we've found is that businesses, and a lot of our members in international businesses are a little less, um, are more apprehensive to move into regions where there's um, lack of uniform construction codes or building codes that are actually enforced and kept up. And the reason why I say that is that, as we've seen in other areas, that they get, if there's not enforced standards or construction codes, a lot of um, unsafe products are being shipped in through other means, and they can't, and at a very dis strong discount, it can't um, be um, met, met or competed with. So what, what, is, uh, what is the Philippines doing to try to not only update standards and codes, but also try to bring it up to enforcement levels? So not just having it on the books, but actually enforcing the products that are being brought into the market, because that'll drive more uh, commerce into the region as well. Um, okay. Uh, he's not up here, though, so no, can we ask him to we'll, address it later? Yeah. In no, maybe speech? we can ask him to. Pass the microphone. Uh, can you pass the microphone to the secretary? Yeah. Secretary of Public Works. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I might doze off there. I'm just long, long trip from the Philippines. Anyway, uh, I did mention that uh, the National Building Code is being implemented by the DPWH. We are the national building official, and part of our program is the National Sewerage and Sanitation Master Plan for the whole country. And in fact, we're aggressively implementing uh, projects that will improve coverage of both uh, potable water and sanitation services. So we definitely would like to, we would welcome uh, trade associations helping us uh, do the upgrading of building codes. We just finished the upgrading of our national building code to make it uh, adaptable to more resilient structures. Uh, we have recently approved the National Building Green Code. So we will be launching that very soon so that the new structures will have to adopt certain standards on green buildings. So as I said, uh, as far as sanitation and uh, sewerage, uh, definitely that's an alley that, uh, that would like to work with the industry associations. Great. Well, um, Secretary Sing Son, thank you for that uh, spontaneous response. Uh, he will be uh, speaking this afternoon, and maybe you uh, will hear more uh, about this or have another chance to question him. Let me also say, since you mentioned building standards, and uh, the, the, this building you're in, if you didn't know, is one of the first platinum LEEDS uh, buildings in Washington. So we're very proud of our, wow. of our um, uh, record there on environmental design. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, just a second. Could you wait for the microphone? So, <coughs> <coughs> thank you. 
I'm Gloria Federigan. Thank you for thank you CIS, US Philippine Society and Philippine Embassy for having this this um, event. Um, you have provided us with some rosy current scenarios and projected scenarios of the Philippines. We appreciate that. My um, many of us are American citizens. But because of patrimony from the Philippines, we have deep affection for the Philippines and the Filipinos. We want to help. Some of us individually or as part of Philippine organizations provide donations, assistance to some individuals and some parties in the Philippines. I know my question will, be, will not be about official development, whether bilateral or multilateral. How can ordinary Americans, like Filipino Americans, that would like to invest in the Philippines, apart from what they invest in local companies or real estate, is there any listing or information of American companies doing business in the Philippines that will welcome very small investors? Um, I'd appreciate if you have a comment on that. Is that something you could address? Yeah. Well, uh, I think yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to be investing directly in companies, uh, but what you can do is there are a lot of actually uh, funds that uh, invest in the Philippines. Uh, there's uh, some Philippine funds, you know, the exchange traded funds, the ETFs. Uh, so I think that may be the, the best uh, way to do it. Now, there are some funds uh, as well that are being set up in the Philippines itself, so you can invest directly into those funds. But it would be difficult to advise for the retail investor to invest directly in companies unless you want to do it through the Philippine Stock Exchange or through the stock exchange in, let's say, in New York, NYSE, uh, through those exchange traded funds. Embassy might be able to help yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the um, Ambassador Quisi is, is signaling himself. So I think <laughs> if you uh, if you contact the Philippines Embassy, which is right across the street, um, I'm sure they can be helpful. Their commercial or um, economic counselors, I'm sure, would be would be able to help you. Thank you. Very is that much. helpful? Um, okay. Yes, sir. And then I'm going to turn this direction. So if anybody over there, yeah, ma'am, ma'am, there, this gentleman here, and then the woman there. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Lau. Uh, there have been reports or factual reports about Chinese um, illegal workers in the Philippines. And number two is the uh, black sand magnetite mining in the Philippines. Uh, on the illegal workers, how did they get there? And to the, it's not just black sand, but other Philippine natural resources being exported out to China, for example. Well, okay. yeah. well, I think the illegal worker problem is uh, not unique to the Philippines. Uh, we, we do have our fair share. It's also present here, I guess, and in many other countries. Uh, and yes, we do have uh, reports of uh, illegal workers. Uh, uh, I guess a lot of them come from China. And so the immigration authorities are, are, are dealing with that. And again, be Philippines on the other question uh, about the, the harvesting of our natural resources and being uh, brought elsewhere. Again, Philippines being an archipelagic no nation, we have 7,000 islands. Uh, it's really very hard to protect in particular the marine resources. So uh, we see a number of nations uh, that are you know, are in violation of this. But again, that problem is not unique to us. Indonesia faces the same thing. Vietnam faces the same problem, uh, Malaysia. So it's, uh, that's being addressed by the Coast Guard. Uh, but again, with, I think we have 35,000 kilometers of coastlines uh, and not that many ships. It's very hard for us to really patrol all, <coughs> all of our coastline. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, there was one. 
Good morning, I'm Mitzi Picard of US Filipinos for Good Governance, formerly of Asia Society. I have a question for Bill, since you're not a politician. Um, Most um, of us aren't politicians. <laughs> well, because Secretary Dominguez said he doesn't answer politically inclined <laughs> questions. But anyway, um, Bill, you mentioned about municipalities and other parts of the Philippines. How is the economic picture looking in Mindanao? And what happens if the Bangsamoro law doesn't pass? My question for the Millennium Challenge and Mr. Gluski, because I want to include all of you, um, is um, how, are, how is your investment looking in Mindanao and how do you look upon it in the future if or without the Bangsamoro? And the Millennium Challenge, how is the poverty rate, um, is it increasing or diminishing in Mindanao? Thank you. Okay, that's a, everybody gets to okay. take that on. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I guess if you look at Mindanao, it's been uh, uh, punching below its weight uh, relative to its you know, size and potential for, for the country. Um, it has some vibrant uh, areas uh, in, um, in Mindanao. If you take a look at the Cagayan de Oro to Iligan Corridor, if you take a look at the uh, uh, General Santos area, Davao area, uh, but there are obviously some other some other uh, problem areas. I, w I would say that um, one disadvantage Mindanao faces is in the area of just a simple issuance of travel advisories, where if something happens in one area of Mindanao, a travel advisory uh, tends to sort of blanket the entire area, so that affects uh, areas which otherwise are, are quite uh, peaceful and, and progressive. So that's something that, that would be great if we could address that, um, that issue. Um, what should happen if Bangsamoro Basic Law doesn't get passed? Uh, I, I think that would be unfortunate. Uh, I, I think that is the best chance, uh, whatever problems people might have, uh, might see with it, I think that is still the, uh, the best chance we've seen in, in decades to bring uh, peace to Mindanao and, and prosperity. And it's, it's been really difficult, I think, to, to attract uh, businesses and investments to an area that that they feel uh, is not stable or or, or safe. Uh, so one of the air, one of the things we've, we're trying to do at NCC is to try to bring in uh, more data about cities and municipalities within that area, so they can be measured. And and one of the things I've I've told people in Mindanao is that you know you can't wait for BBL at least get listed on the index so people know what it's like to do business. In your in your area, so uh, slowly I'll be able to fill that gap and uh, and and project more information about what it's like to do business in in Mindanao. Uh, I, I think it's uh, maybe still just one of the uh, areas that is uh, so low profile in terms of business activity. Uh, people don't really advertise what's going on out, out there, but uh, I think there's there's great potential for for Mindanao. Okay, Andres, did you want to um, take that on? You're not, actually. Am I sorry. Yep. Sure. Well, right now, all of our activities are in Luzon, and our big expansions we're thinking about is Luzon. But as we get more into using new technologies like the lithium-ion batteries, you have to put them on each island. So certainly, uh, sort of Mindanao is not sort of blacklisted. Uh, it would depend where in Mindanao, honestly. Uh, and probably we would uh, follow big clients like mining companies, you know, to provide power for them. Uh, but certainly uh, a successful pacification program would open up more areas. Okay, Matt? Sure, Millennium Challenge Corporation. We, uh, in particular, were actually not focused on Mindanao. Uh, part of that was because uh, the U.S. government through USAID had a lot of uh, focus on that area. And so, we we wanted to have some geographic complementarity, so I can't speak to the to the poverty rates in Mindanao. I will say that um, as as you're right in the sense that there's a need to push out and decentralize a lot of the focus of development into some of these areas, and I think some of these efforts, working with the municipalities and local governments, uh, should uh, should have impact on that. Okay. Um, yes, sir. There, and then that gentleman. Thank you. 
Um, hello, uh, I'm Greg Rushford. I publish the Rushford Report on um, trade <coughs> politics. Um, uh, my question would be for Secretary Domingo. Uh, could you just talk a minute or two about how the uh, South China Sea issues have affected the Philippines' trading relationship with China? Uh, yeah. Hi, Greg. I like your name. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he was just in the Philippines and I met him. <laughs> uh, Actually, in terms of our trade relationship with China, uh, it hasn't affected, that hasn't been affected at all. Uh, in fact, that grew by double digits uh, from 2013 to 2014. So we continue to have very good two-way uh, trade relationship with China. Now, from an investments perspective, uh, we were also not uh, affected by it because China never invested big in the Philippines in the first place. So when we counted it, uh, I think four years ago, the investments of China into the <laughs> Philippines was really minuscule. It was around $600 million, uh, total cumulative. So very small investment in the Philippines. And in fact, the Philippine investments to China were much bigger. It was about $2.8 billion. So, so when, uh, with, even with the South China Sea issue, we haven't seen really a significant change on the investment side. But on the trade side, it's very robust and healthy. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Uh, my understanding is that in, in, their, um, in their infrastructure series of initiatives in, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, China, the so-called One Belt, One Road uh, initiative, that China has indicated that it may not include Philipp the Philippines in uh, this uh, package of initiatives. Is that correct? Um, and if so, you know, what do you think about that? Uh, well, <coughs> since we haven't seen that share happen in the past, uh, I think we will not feel it in the sense that it will not be a loss because it was never there in the first place. But to the extent that maybe we're missing out on an opportunity, well, then that's a lost opportunity. I see. Okay. Uh, and I think I, uh, I oh, it was that gentleman I recognize, and there was a gentleman here and a lady there. Good morning. Ryan Jacobson, Global Federation Competitive Councils. Uh, my question primarily is for Secretary Domingo. The, um, this year, the, A, uh, the Asian economic, ASEAN economic community is supposed to get into full effect. Um, you talked about how the Philippines' primary resource is human capital. Do you think the, with the full initiation of the AC, the human capital might have some problems? Like people talk about some jobs going to other ASEAN countries and some people from other ASEAN countries coming to the Philippines taking jobs, whether that affects investment like the thermal plant that was all Filipinos, would that change um, other nations sending labor to the Philippines and vice versa? Okay, uh, from an ASEAN perspective, the big bang for ASEAN happened in July, uh, January 1, 2010. That's when the trade and, uh, trade and goods agreement took full effect, uh, which meant that uh, over 99% of the goods traded among at least the original six uh, where uh, the duties were reduced to zero, January 1, 2010. So from a trade in goods perspective, we've been competing already, full blast since 2010. So from a trade in goods, the Asian economic community will have very little impact. Okay. Now, when you talk about the trade in services component and uh, the other components, there was uh, this target of about 500 plus action steps that have to be completed by December 31 of this year. Now, the Ashen way is not big bang. It's by doing things, you know, little by little. So as of today, uh, most of the Ashen members have already complied with about 80% of that 500 plus list. We're trying to get to 90% by the end of the year. That is the target. And so, again, by the end of the year, it's not going to be big bang because 80% already has been accomplished. So there's another 10% that we're trying to accomplish between now and the end of the year. So I, I think we'll wake up January 1, 2016 
not feeling really the uh, a big bang in effect. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, Nelson Garcia from WIPG, we're a professional networking organization here in Washington that, uh, whose members work in the U.S. Congress, federal agencies, and uh, private sector, and work very closely with the embassies here in Washington on international policy. The uh, question I have is not too long ago, uh, many Western companies uh, were moving some of their presence away from countries like the Philippines into mainland China in order to penetrate the market share over there. But, uh, and the one company that comes into my mind is what happened with FedEx uh, at Subic Bay, moving their hub operations out of Subic into Guangzhou, China. But ever since the uh, Chinese have begun to undertake a lot of business, less business friendly policies, uh, and the cost of business uh, in, in China has gone up uh, somewhat, um, have you detected any opportunities of recapturing some of that market and some of that presence back into the Philippines uh, in, in, in order to utilize uh, some of our resources there? We have seen we have seen actually a fair amount of movement from China to the Philippines, along with uh, Vietnam and Indonesia in particular. I think the these three countries are getting the, the bulk of the movement south from China. Because a lot of firms now have a China plus one, plus two, plus three strategy. Uh, but China will continue to have its share of uh, manufacturing facilities just because there's a huge domestic demand in China. And it will be difficult for companies to operate in China with having some manufacturing or some big operational presence there. So that will continue to be. Now, if you're talking about, let's say, a hub of FedEx or UPS, uh, China will make a lot of sense because they are the biggest consumer of goods. So it makes sense to locate your hub in the place where the most goods are being uh, shipped to, in and out. Uh, Philippines can act as a secondary hub because in, Asia, in that part of East Asia, Philippines is the most centrally located. That's the reason why the U.S. Air Force Base used to be there. The Seventh Fleet was also based there before, because it's very central. It's the only country in that part of the world that can claim that you're within four hours flight of any major capital, whether it be Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, Shanghai, Bangkok, Phnom Penh, Phnom Penh, uh, uh, Hanoi, Jakarta, Singapore, KL. Okay, it's the Philippines that is right at the center of all of, all of this. So we can act as a secondary hub, but not the primary hub, just because of the volume. Volume will go to China in and out. Uh, the other reason why there's a big movement from China, and it's actually in their plan, it's deliberate, is they're really migrating their, their policies to a higher value added type of manufacturing, uh, manufacturing game. And they're either pushing the companies inland or they're pushing the companies out. It's deliberate strategy on their part. And so what they've done is they've raised the wages in China. In, in a JETRO survey, JETRO is the Japanese agency, they did a salary survey uh, in manufacturing from 2009 to 2014, uh, sorry, 2009 to 2014, and uh, they did the survey for Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and China. The, for the workers, Philippines uh, had an average sal wage growth rate of 2.2% over that period. China had a growth rate of 14.8%. So in absolute numbers, just to give you a comparison, in 2009, the average salary of the worker in the Philippines was $3,600 versus China's 4100 So China was slightly more expensive than the Philippines in 2009. In 2014, Philippines was at $4,000, while China was at $8,200. So in 2014, China's wage cost was already more than double that of the Philippines. From a small 
premium in 2009, it's now more than double. So, and because of that, a lot of the lower value added manufacturing is moving out. They, they're, they're maybe not, they're not totally moving out, but they're diversifying into uh, lower costing countries like Philippines, Indonesia, and <coughs> Vietnam. So that's also the reason why you're seeing the average manufacturing growth in the Philippines uh, register 8.8% per year over the last two years. So very strong manufacturing growth. And we see it. Uh, we see a lot of mega plants now being uh, put up in the <coughs> Philippines. And uh, Apple CEO, uh, Mr. Cook, right, announced last year that they will start producing Apple products in the Philippines. So that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're seeing. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then this woman, and then I think we're gonna wrap up. Beth Wong with the Maryland Governors Commission in Asian Pacific. I have two questions, one for Secretary Domingo and the other one for Mr. Glesky. So with all the investments, Secretary Domingo, what's the current credit rating of the Philippines? And with Mr. Glesky, um, I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, AES is in the power call operation, which is in the province of Zambales. Right. If so, how many uh, <coughs> beneficiary or how many areas is AES distributing in the area of the Philippines. Follow up on that. Is there something that you can do? There is a current existing power plant which is being mothballed or scrapped by the Philippine government. And I'm talking about the nuclear power plant built by Westinghouse in the past, which hasn't been operated many years now. And I have been my husband designed the HBAC, heating and cooling on that with the Westinghouse. And Nothing happened on that. Okay. okay. Uh, SNP, Moody's, and Fitch have all rated us uh, the Philippines investment grade. SNP in particular has rated us two levels uh, 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 investment grade. Okay, we're one level above the basic investment grade level. And uh, Philippines, the Philippine banking system also is the only one in the world which has a positive outlook from uh, one of the three. I forget which one. I think S&P. S&P prob is probably the one. So the only one in the world. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I think... Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in Luzon, our big power plant sells mostly to Moralco. So then it's distributed ar around the island of Luzon. Um, but recently, you know, we won a, a bid for providing energy to the cooperatives that they banded together. And we wanted it at the lowest price it's ever been bid in the Philippines. So we're very proud of that. And so we're trying to um, diversify and, and add new capacity. Um, in terms of the uh, nuclear plant, we do every type of energy except for nuclear. <laughs> so, um, and, and that has to do a lot with you know, the, the size of nuclear and, and the insurance issues, et cetera. So we can do any type of energy except for nuclear. Okay, excellent. And uh, yes, ma'am. And, and then one more in the back, and then we'll, we'll finish. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, my name is Rita Herona Adkins. My question is, it has been mentioned that the United States has a very important relationship with the Philippines and vice versa. Um, I think the business community in the Philippines would primarily agree with that. Now, President Obama is scheduled to go to Asia, the Pacific region, sometime this fall. What would, be, what would be the message that uh, specifically the business community in the Philippines would want to stress to the American president, uh, considering that United States is pivoting, <coughs> to use that word, towards Asia, while the Philippines is not yet part of the TPP, and maybe someday it will be, but what specifically uh, would be the message of the business community in the Philippines to the American, to the American president, and particularly in exploring the market in the United States for whatever products in the Philippines that could be uh, encouraged with infrastructure and business incentives, etc. Okay, Bill. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Well, we we look forward to welcoming. Uh, President Obama to the 
the APEC leaders meeting in, um, in November. I, I think the key message really is to uh, continue and aggressively, you know, move with the pivot to, to Asia. Um, I, I think that's, that's good for Asia Pacific, that's, that's good for the U.S. Um, that, that's where a lot of the growth in the markets uh, are. So I think that that would be the, the key message. The other thing is looking at the TPP, uh, and, and as Secretary uh, Domingo mentioned, it's something that, that we would like to be part of. I, I think that we should take a look at what those uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, disqualifying elements would be for the Philippines and uh, have a, a second look at them. Uh, it's difficult for us to change the Constitution to be able to, to fit into that uh, TPP uh, context, but I, I think we are not the only uh, economy uh, in that TPP equation uh, that has these disqualifying elements. So that's something I think we should look at it with, with some, some, some open eyes. And the third thing I think on TPP is that uh, it's not just trade and goods, but if we could simultaneously have trade and services included, I think that would put some, some uh, uh, element of, of, of um, or, or a push, a positive push uh, for the Philippines, that's, that's what we can contribute, if not trade in goods. Trade in services certainly is an area where we could help and we could benefit. I mentioned that I like APEC, and one of the reasons is there's a very good opportunity for the leaders to interact with, uh, with the business community during the summit, both at the uh, ABAC, the um, APEC Business Advisory Committee um, uh, sessions that are built into the leaders. Uh, sessions and then the CEO forum, which is also um, held during that time. So there's a good opportunity for that kind of that kind of dialogue with all the leaders, including President Obama. Okay, I'm going to take two more together. The gentleman in the back and the gentleman here. Thank you. My name is Peter Tiemann with the Denton's Law Firm. I'm an energy partner here in D.C. We have the honor of working with PP uh, on a PPP project in the Philippines. But my uh, question is uh, to Energy and Mr. Glusky. Um, you'd mentioned renewable power, uh, battery storage capabilities. Are there incentive programs in the Philippines like there are here in the U.S. about production tax credits or investment tax credits that encourage for, uh, you know, outside investors to come in and put in wind power projects or solar projects? Uh, the other question related to that is to get that power from those islands to the grid, you know, grid reliability and mm -hmm. the storms are very important. Are there opportunities there for hardening of the grid and, and, uh, and the like for reliability? Okay. okay. And, and then sure. this gentleman will take it at the same time, could we? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm uh, Roberto Yamas with the U.S. Philippine Society. and. My question is to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and sorry, I apologize, I, did, I didn't get your name earlier. But uh, earlier you were talking about the intervention programs for the first compact granted to the Philippines, and there were three areas that you mentioned, uh, tax administration reform, infrastructure quality with strong emphasis on road infrastructure and uh, climate resiliency design as well as uh, empowering LGUs to undertake uh, small-scale infrastructure projects independently with uh, PPP participation. My question is, you know, I understand that the, second, the first compact is about to expire, and if the Philippines is going to get a second compact, what kind of intervention programs would MCC be looking at for the... Okay, thank you. Sure. Andres. Oh, the Philippines has uh, renewable goals. And so recently they had two bids, one in solar and one in wind. And the wind bid was oversubscribed uh, because the resources are very good in the Philippines. Uh, solar, on the other hand, was undersubscribed, did not fill the whole uh, amount. Um, so they don't have specific tax credits uh, per se. Um, in terms of the batteries, the, the key that they could do is when you have a lot of renewables, they fluctuate. The wind gusts, the uh, clouds pass over uh, the solar farms. So with batteries, you can actually, uh, with ancillary services, make the output mimic a hydro plant or a uh, 
thermal plant. So that's really the key. Now, why hasn't this taken up? We, we're actually building one in the Philippines, but a small one. I think the potential is, is enormous. Uh, and, and basically, it's that like most regulators all over the world, the regulation tends to be backward looking. And it's important to have it sufficiently broad so you can introduce new technologies if it's very specific. So I, I hope that answers your, answers your question. Okay, thanks, you know. Matt. Sure, very briefly, our, our first compact partnership actually ends uh, <coughs> uh, next May, and so it's coming to a close. Um, the way our model works, rather than talk about what we're going to do, uh, maybe I'll emphasize the how for the second compact partnership. Um, we're in the process of doing what we call a constraints to growth analysis together with Bill and, and a team there, so it's very much demand driven, and the idea is to find, you know, what are the impediments to foreign direct investment, to economic growth? to uh, distribution uh, among the poor in terms of the poor participating in economic activities so that they can move. Um, so we don't know yet what we're going to be focusing on. However, the how part is important. You know, we are set up not to have a perpetual long-term relationship with countries. We really want to work ourselves out of a job. We really want to be a spark so that the private sector can take over. Uh, we can focus on some of the public goods. Um, and as we look at our subsequent partnership, I think we're very interested in, one, seeing uh, opportunities to partner with the private sector so we can mobilize private capital around some of uh, our interventions. And two, we, we, our expectation is, is that the government of the Philippines and civil society um, take a role both in terms of putting in resources, uh, both financial and human capital <coughs> resources, to help uh, scale, uh, hopefully, the impact of what we've accomplished. So it's still very early. Philippines was declared eligible for a second compact, which is a recognition of all of the good that's been happening over the next five <coughs> years. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see what comes out of this constraints analysis. Uh, but I do suspect that it will be focused more on how do we mobilize private sector capital around what we're doing and how do we unlock that so that we can uh, phase back and phase out eventually. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give Secretary Domingo one minute uh, if you want to wrap up and uh, make any final comments. Yes, uh, my final comment is uh, we're actually... Oh, sorry. Yeah, we actually... Uh, came here to the U.S. really to, to spread the good word about the Philippines. The Philippine growth story is good. It's going to be there for many years to come. Uh, from a business perspective from the U.S., we see participation in the power sector. We see a lot of participation in the business process outsourcing sector. But we see very little out, uh, in the manufacturing sector. We'd like to see more American firms, really, to look at the Philippines and see what we have to offer in the, from the manufacturing side. Because the rest of the world is there. The Japanese, the Taiwanese, the Europeans, they're all putting up new manufacturing plants in the Philippines. But unfortunately, for some reason, the U.S. firms are absent, outside of the ones that are already there who are expanding. So we hope that with uh, this presentation that we can convince some of you to start coming to the Philippines and participate. Thank you. Okay, with that final uh, uh, clarion call um, um, for U.S. investment in the Philippines, uh, we'll wrap up this session. Uh, great questions, uh, terrific answers. I, I think, this, uh, no question, this was the most informative and insightful hour and a half I've spent uh, this week, and so I, uh, I very much appreciate the panelists, and please join me in thanking all the panelists for joining us.